There are a few phrases that seem to me all to refer to the same concept. One of them is, life happens. Amen. It just does. Life happens. So tonight, when life happens. Let's see. Life happens every moment of every day. Isn't that fair to say? Yes. Ever a day go by that life doesn't happen? No. There's something going on all the time. Maybe we put it this way. There's never a dull moment. Or you don't know what a day may bring forth. Well, that one comes from the Proverbs, chapter 27 and verse 1. You don't know. Uh, you can get up one day and expect that this is what's going to happen, and it take a 180-degree turn it happens all the time. And then you can expect things that aren't going to be good to happen. And in fact, you have the greatest time that you've ever had. Life is just that way. And when life happens, what do we do? Well, this passage in 1 John, if you want to turn over there and notice in chapter 5, this text that was read, I think is has some interesting things in it that I want to share for just a few minutes because we can all relate to the concepts that are found in here, at least some things that I want to say are very relatable to every one of us. The passage is about prayer. The passage says we can have confidence and we can commit to the thing we have confidence in. Prayer is how we respond to life as it happens. And as we pray and as we are responding to life as it happens, the results vary. And that's what I want to think about in just a minute. First, let's notice Verse 14, he says, we have this confidence. It is a compound word combining two words. One of them is the word all with the word proverb or saying meant to be remembered. So what he is telling us we have this confidence. We have all of these things that witness, left as witnesses, that we ought to remember going forward. We have this confidence. What is the confidence that we have? If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That is our confidence. That is what has been established. That is the resolve. That is the witness that has been left to us. All we have to do is filter through scriptures, read the prayers of people, and notice how God answers. But you can also, and I can also say, in our lives, we have seen or we felt or we've experienced that, that we pray according to his will and he hears us. But notice the phrase, according to his will. Now that phrase, I found someone who had these thoughts to say about that phrase, according to his will. Number one, when life happens, we should pray according to his declared will. Didn't he say? Jesus did. Seek and you'll find. Knock, it'll be open. Ask, you'll receive. That is his invitation. And there are numbers of things that he has declared to us that we must be consistent with when we pray. One example might be James 1, 5. If any of you lack wisdom, ask God, and he gives to all men without 
partiality. So it's okay, according to his declared will, for me to pray for wisdom. Now, you think about all of the things that God has said by declaration that we can pray for. And if I am praying in according to his declared will, what does he say? He'll hear. He'll listen. He'll respond. Number two, when life happens, pray according to his perfect will. His perfect will. You and I aren't able to know what is the perfect thing to do every single time. We just don't know. We don't have that capacity. I'm not the arbiter. You're not the arbiter, the judge of what is the perfect will of God. Jesus is the perfect example. Three times he prayed in the garden, Matthew 26. If this cup can pass from me, let it. If not, your will be done. What was he asking? Is there a better way? Can we do the same thing in a different way? He wasn't trying to get out, I think. He's not trying to get out of the end game. The end game was to save a lost world. He wasn't trying to avoid that. We should not read that into his statement. He wasn't saying, do I really have to save these people? He was saying, Lord, we need to save these people. But can we do it any other way? He was willing for God to decide what the perfect will was. Number three, this person said, when you pray according to his will, pray according to his current will. It would not be proper to pray that God would perform some obvious great miracle to make a point. He's not doing that anymore. As I understand Scripture, God is not operating that way anymore. It was perfectly fine when Paul was in the midst of preaching and a man was blaspheming and contradicting everything he said. It was a man named Elamus. Paul looked down and said, you're going to be blind for a season. Boom, blind. I can't pray that God would blind somebody to make a point. Nor can I pray that God would miraculously open up the eyes of a blind person to make a point. Because that is not the current will of God. But then finally, number four, he said, when life happens, pray according to his universal will. In James 4, there was a discussion there about people who said, tomorrow we're going to go into such a city and we're going to buy and sell and get gain. And then he says, you don't know what is on tomorrow. Your life is like a vapor. It appears for a little time and then vanishes away. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Here's what I wonder, what I think about in that. Take a family. A family with a number of people. Children. And one of the children asks the parents for something that if the parent grants it, disrupts the entire family. Probably the parent's not going to do that, even though the child asks. Because parents are responsible for the universe in which they live. They have to make decisions based on the whole family, not just that one. And children would do that. Well, sometimes 
we might pray with the attitude that God would do something special for me, but God knows that he has to manage the universe. And he is not want to stop a person who is falling down by ceasing gravity for a moment. Because in helping the one, he's messed everybody else up. So we need to ask according to his will. Now, according to this text, if you read a couple of verses after it, he gives us an example. He says, there is a sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. The idea is you don't pray for the sin unto death. Someone wants to know, what is that? I don't want to commit a sin that causes my death. Well, I believe the context is clear. That what he's saying is any sin that is unforgiven, any time we sin and refuse to repent, it could lead to spiritual death. It just could. So what if we have a person over here refusing to stop sinning? Refusing to change life. Flying in the face of God and the brethren of the church and saying, I'm going to keep doing this. I think God is telling me I can't pray that God will forgive them in that state. I can't do it. That's not according to his will. I could pray that he or she would come into contact with something that would change their minds. I could pray that they have time to get out of whatever it is. I could pray that I could be used in the situation, but it would be wrong to pray, God, you're a merciful and good God, and I'm going to ask you, save them anyway. Can't do that. We have to pray according to his will. That is our confidence. That's what's been left as a witness for all time to be remembered that when we do it, he hears us. Number two then, commit. Commit to it. When life happens, commit to prayer. Number one, when we pray and something good happens, praise God who is good. I have mentioned at various times that there are very many people in the world who, with whom, according to my understanding of Scripture, I very likely don't have a relationship with them in Christ because they don't accept what the Scripture teaches about being in Christ. And yet those people, in their faith, their religion, their life, they seem more willing to say, thank you, Lord, or praise God for every single thing that happens good in life that I don't do very much. I think we should. I think maybe we should practice more saying, thank you, God. I've been praying for good things to happen, and this is obviously a good thing, so I'm going to give you credit for it. It's not a matter of saying, oh, I know that God made it happen, and here's how. He did this. He did. It's a matter of saying, God is good, and when good things happen, give him the praise. Number two, when life happens, commit to prayer 
And out of that prayer, in the midst of that situation, something bad happens, then pray to God who is good that something good will come from it. I recall in Romans or Acts chapter 4, the church was assembled there because the persecution of Christians had begun. And the apostles were beaten for their faith and told, now don't you preach anymore. And when they let them go, they went to where the church was assembled and the Bible says, and they prayed. But notice what they prayed. They didn't pray, Lord, punish those bad people. A bad thing happened. They didn't pray, Lord, take the bad thing away. They didn't pray that either. Here's what they prayed. Lord, give them strength to go through the bad thing. That's what they prayed. So, when bad things are happening, life is happening in a bad way, as you pray, pray for something good to come from the bad thing. Now, I don't think that it is wrong to pray for difficulties to be removed. Jesus did in that prayer. I don't want to go through this. Take it away. But he was allowing God's will to be done. When we pray in the midst of bad things, ask for something good to come from it. Certainly. Quickly go to Romans chapter 8. Let me outline something for you real fast that I have found helpful in my thought process. We all know verse 28. Uh, we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are called according to His purpose. Some time ago, it occurred to me that he says, we know that all things work together for good. Am I supposed to say that Cancer works for good. Am I supposed to say that financial difficulties work for good? Is he saying that addictions work for good? I've decided no. Here's what I think the things are. What things work for our good? Verses 1 through 11. In the midst of very difficult things, the fact that we do not stand condemned before God, verse 1, works for our good. Because sometimes we have the opinion maybe that when something bad is happening to us, that's God condemning us for something we did. I'm not denying that God chastens and disciplines his children. That's not what I'm talking about. Oftentimes we look at the difficulties of life as punishment from God, a beating from God. He's condemning us. I stand condemned. The first 11 verses of this chapter say, no, you're not a condemned. If you're a child of God, you don't walk around every day condemned. Therefore, the bad things are not meant to condemn you. Number two. Look at verse 12 beginning through verse 17. This idea that we are children of God works for our good in difficult situations. Remembering that I'm a child of God when things are not good, in fact they are bad, is a comforting and peaceful thought. 
That's one of the things that works for my good when other things are working against my good. Look at verse 18. Beginning in verse 18 down through verse 25, he closes that section, verse 25, talking about the hope that we have. One of the things that makes good come out of bad things is that we always have hope. You and I have all, we've met people, we've been with people who are going through some very difficult things in life and they are hopeless. They know it. They feel it. They're in a cloud of darkness. We have hope. That's why you can go see Ed and he'll smile and he'll talk and he'll laugh. And others that you might go see are depressed, crying, and moaning all the time. They don't have any hope. But our hope is one of those things. And finally, number four, starting in verse 26, the Spirit of God is one of those things that helps us when things are bad. You know, I could have gone in reverse order, actually, and begin with that. Because isn't it true that through the Spirit living within us, we are not condemned? That's what marks us as a child of God. And it's Him living in us that gives us our hope. Maybe He's saying, Verse 28, we know that all of the Spirit's things work together for our good. The tools of the Spirit, the provisions of the Spirit, those things work together for our good. So when life happens and things are bad, if it's bad, Pray to God who is good to pull something good out of it and he will do it through his spirit who lives within us. And finally, third, when life happens and we pray and then nothing happens, we don't see an answer. It doesn't seem to register that things are different then pray to God who is good to be patient. Listen to the words of David in Psalm 130. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Verse 5. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. If you don't see an answer, be patient and ask God to give it to you. Because when life happens, Sometimes it's going to be good. Praise God. Sometimes it's going to be bad. Ask God to make something good come from it. And sometimes it seems like no answer comes. Be patient. Because you know what James said in chapter 1, verse 4? Let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete Lacking nothing. Patience has a perfect work that it can do within us. And guess what? 
Nobody ever learned patience when things are smooth and good and easy and nice and simple. You don't learn patience that way. You learn patience when things are not going the way you would like them to go, when things don't seem to have an answer, when things are messed up, when things just don't work. That's when you learn patience. And maybe that is what God is doing in answer to the prayer when life happens. Different ones are going through different things. I hope that maybe the reminder of those things might help you. And if things are good, praise God, don't forget, because likely it's going to turn bad, and you're going to need something good to come from it. And then the rest of the time, you're just going to wonder, am I ever going to get an answer? Just be patient. Tonight, if you're ready to be with the Lord, have Him on your side to be with you when life happens. If you're not a child of God, tonight would be a great time to obey the gospel. Tonight would be a great time to get your life right with God in a public fashion if you need us or in private fashion just between you and the Lord. Can we help you tonight while we stand and sing together?